Well, welcome everyone to the Paul Mullen Centre. Those of you who are in the room with us this evening at Bedford Square and those of you who are joining us online, it's always great to have such um, a large and lively community who join our research sem seminars and hear about some really interesting and new uh, work. My name is Sarah Turner. I'm the director of the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art. I know quite a few people in the room, but for those of you who are new, and coming to the centre for the first time, I want to extend a particularly warm welcome and say I hope you'll stay around after the seminar for those very important parts of the whole intellectual offering, the drinks, where we also get to talk to one another and network. And for those of you who are online, I hope you also feel very much included and will join the conversation, the questions through our chat box and also um, offering questions online. We will read those out after the seminar. But it's a really great pleasure to welcome Jill Burke to the Paul Mellon Centre. Jill told me we were having a chat before the event. It's her first visit to the centre, so a really warm welcome uh, to you, Jill. And we were having um, you know, a bit of a chat about what she's doing, and I said, you know, we're really expanding the boundaries of British art. And she said, good, because this isn't really British or art. <laughs> so, uh, but I promised her that the Paul Mellon Centre um, offers a very kind of generous um, and expansive research space and we're always interested in themes and topics and ideas in history of art, in visual culture, in material cultures um, and I know we will find many kind of deep and interesting connections um, in your paper um, tonight. Um, Jill is a cultural historian and professor of Renaissance visual and material cultures at the University of Edinburgh, focusing on Italy and Europe around 1400 to 1700. And her most recent book, How to Be a Renaissance Woman, The Untold History of Beauty and Female Cre uh, Creativity, was published in 2023. And that considers women's creative engagement with beauty cultures in early modern Italy. And if you want to, Jill's got an amazing career and lots of incredible publications and there's a bio online so I will direct you to that because I know you've come to listen to, to her and not me. The title of this paper as you can see on our screen is Cosmetics, Beauty and the Nature of Renaissance Women. So without further ado I'm going to hand over to Jill and ask you to join with me in giving her a very warm welcome. Um, thank you, and, and thank you for coming, and thank you to the Paul Mellon Centre for inviting me. It's really great to be here, even though I'm an interloper because I don't do it British art at all. I do Italian things, um, and maybe I'll tempt you all over to Italy, which isn't probably very hard sell, to be honest, um, and though it's very nice weather in London at the moment. Um, so it's been, for me, a really busy year. I, my book came out last August. And here it is. It's available at all good bookshops, and it's coming out in paperback in August. Um, it was, um, and also I was involved in an exhibition and an installation that's now on at the Welcome Collection, um, where I worked with some designers to put together a multi-sensorial um, installation about Renaissance women's engagement with beauty. That's part of the Cult of Beauty exhibition. It's free, and you go along to see it. Um, now, I've talked uh, so much about Renaissance cosmetics over the past uh, few months. I was really expecting this paper to be a doddle to write. And of course, it wasn't at all. It was really tough because one of the things I wanted to do today is to think about things that I hadn't thought about for the book and I hadn't thought about for the exhibition. And in particular, I kind of wanted to niggle away at something that I'd been thinking about for a while which is a relationship between cosmetics and artifice and cosmetics and gender. Why are cosmetics associated with women, mainly? Um, and this is the question that, um, in Renaissance Italy and, and today, and this is the question that I, I want to ask uh, today, and how that's related to ideas of nature. Um, so the relationship between cosmetics, nature, and artifice thread through the sources, all the sources I've looked at for the book, um, and there's kind of a, uh, I, said, I, I wrote down thread through the sources, sources like a running stitch that I've tried to get, this is a terrible metaphor, I'm sorry, that I've tried to gather here <laughs> without too much snagging. Um, though there is a lot of snagging because the sources about cosmetics, the sources about women using cosmetics are normally written by men. 
um, because a lot of women couldn't write. And so one of the challenges in this, um, in this research is trying to find women's um, voices. Um, so, but I hope as well, sorry, I'm just carrying on. This is the last threading metaphor. I hope there's creative possibilities in, this, in these loose threads, in this lack of uh, voices. There's also kind of a space that we can think about and we can fill in uh, with more innovative methodologies. Okay, and although I, I don't, this isn't really about art, this paper, we're going to start with the painting anyway. <laughs> so this is Caravaggio's Martha and Mary um, from 1598. It was rediscovered in the 1970s, one of those exciting rediscoveries, um, and um, cleaned, and everyone uh, agreed it was by Caravaggio. And like all um, paintings by someone really famous, there's lots of uh, disagreement about what it's really about. Um, and because it's Caravaggio, people want him to be the first person to have painted this subject. But in fact, it's not true at all. This is quite a well-known subject in the 16th and 17th century. And there's an earlier painting uh, associated with this by um, Bernardo Luini, who was um, in the circle of Leonardo da Vinci. Anyway, so... Makeup plays a role in the story of Mary Magdalene, particularly in um, the 16th and 17th century. And if you look at popular tracks from this period, popular poems and verses, plays like this representation of the conversion of um, Santa Maria Magdalene, of St. Mary Magdalene from the um, late uh, 16th century, they imagine a conversation between Mary and her sister Martha, Martha was converted uh, to Christ before, um, before uh, Mary, and Martha is urge, urges her to come to a sermon uh, delivered by Christ, and, and this is what's happening in Caravaggio's painting. Um, in the popular, and what happens is that Mary converts, and then she's so repentant that um, she um, loosens her hair that has been beautifully um, coiffed and beautifully put up. She loosens her hair and washes the feet of Christ with it and pours a big jar of expensive perfume over his feet as well uh, to show that she's eschewed the things of this world. Um, now, this imagined conversation is really bigged up in these um, uh, 16th and 17th century versions of the story, and I'll show you another one here. Um, and um, it's used to talk about the nature of women and their love for makeup. It says, so this says uh, in the top, um, in, in the top bit here, uh, I'll translate the Italian. She used ointments of great value. Mary used ointments of great value and noble waters of fragrant herbs. And so with great pomp, she went about all lascivious. And as she walked proudly, she made her body smell so wonderful, it sweetened every sour muddle, so that when she went outside, the whole town rushed to see her. Um, which sounds great, but apparently that was not a good thing. Um, so... In this story, in the way that Mary Madeline was conceived, um, cosmetics and, a be and beauty and perfume was the external sign of a wayward soul, a shorthand for a kind of errant femininity. It was fine to be beautiful, and the Madeline was beautiful, and that was okay, and I'll, t I'll tell you why that she had to be beautiful uh, later on. Uh, but it's not fine for her to care about being beautiful. Too much interest in one's appearance was an essentially feminine sin, Men who cared about their appearance, and there were a lot of men who cared about their appearance in the Renaissance, were castigated for being effeminate, for being too much like women. So just as Caravaggio was painting this in the late uh, 1590s, a second edition of this book came out, Cosmo Agnelli's loving advice about the abuses of vain women. Um, and it came out in this, I mean, honestly, they're, they're not very nice about women. This is going to be a lot more of this, I'm afraid. Uh, and that came out in, in Bologna, which is a counter-reformation hotbed. Useful, as the frontispiece explains, for virgins, widows, and married women. This pamphlet was issued at least three times in 1582, 92, and 1600. And here is the opening couple of sentences. And again, I'm translating from this section here. Women, uh, Agnelli explains, are curious by nature and long for beauty and ornaments, almost as if 
self-aware of their natural imperfections. They search through these means, that's through the means of cosmetics, to mitigate for the deficiency of nature, and thus to place themselves in men's favour and be esteemed by them. So that it mostly happens, as women's reason is weak and their appetites robust and strong, that they allow themselves to be easily carried away in indulging in these particular varied excesses and disorders. Agnelli picks out three areas for criticism that have been the focus of hatred of women uh, since classical times. Women should not bleach and dress their hair in extravagant ways. They should not use makeup to cover their faces or powder their chests or indeed leave their chests overly revealed. And they should not wear platform shoes that distort their bodily proportions. One of the things that happens with makeup and as a cosmetics historian is there's echoes. You can find echoes of criticism of the use of cosmetics that are really similar and they kind of bounce from period to period in different ways. But they're, they kind of, the discourse is very similar between lots of different um, time periods. These diverse tactics that women used, um, use the body as an artwork, create and recreate looks, even when antagonised rather than attracted men, and that to some men was baffling, and it was down to women's fundamental and natural deficiencies. Okay. I've just put, at this stage, I've just put a painting by Sophie Nisbrangosola of her sisters playing chess in this, just so we can get a little bit of up. Like, women, <laughs> Renaissance women actually did some great things as well as, as kind of hung around getting criticised by, uh, by all these men. Um, why did Agnelli see women as needing to make up for their deficiencies of nature? So, rather than listen to more early modern men, early modern men's hot takes of what's wrong with women, uh, let's go to a text written by a woman. Um, and this is my favourite book of uh, the Italian, early modern Italy. Um, and Moderata, uh, Modera Modesta Pozzo here, um, who writes under the pen name of Moderata Fonte, um, is a bit of a kind of proto-feminist hero. Um, and she wrote one of the first texts, um, I think it's a, along with Lucrezia Marinella, the first um, pro-feminist um, book um, was published in her name in 1600, actually eight years after she'd actually died in childbirth. Um, and it's called The Worth of Women, Il Merito delle Donne, um, and it's been translated into English, so no one has any, any excuse not to read it. Um, the Worth of Women, women where, clearly, where clearly you discover how they are worthy and more um, perfect than men. <laughs> so... Um, Fonte explains um, the humoral system here that is the basis of the way that the body was understood in the early modern period all over uh, Europe and beyond. She says, we are all made up of four elements which combine to form the four principal substances or dispositions of the human body. That is phlegm, which is generated from air, blood from water, choler from fire, and melancholy from earth. Since antiquity, these humours had been associated with the body's degree of moisture and heat, associated with the four elements and also with types of personality. The planets, for example, were said, and I've got another, sorry, this slide isn't so great. Um, the planets were said to govern different humours, as melancholics are born under Saturn, for example, which meant that astrology also played an important part in early modern medicine. Um, as Fonte notes, balances of humours, result in different body types, propensities to illness, and personalities. And this included your sex. So most Renaissance medics believed an idea originally proposed by Aristotle that embryos become female because they don't have sufficient heat to push out male genitalia. Um, so women are dominated by cold and damp humours, uh, whereas energetic masculinity is hot and dry. And this is famous image that um, I always, students really love to talk about, uh, that's, um, of the, of the uh, uterus. This is an image of the uterus in Vesalius's um, De Humani Corporis Fabrica, a very important anatomical text that came out in 1542. Um, and it takes up the Galenic idea, actually, that was very popular in the early 16th century, that women's um, genitalia are merely inverted versions of men that didn't um, have enough heat to get pushed outwards. Um, so this, this means that women were naturally inferior to men. 
Castiglione, in his book of the Courtier, has a character called Gaspare, who claims that man is by his natural qualities more perfect than woman, who is cold by temperament and man warm, and warmth is far nobler and more perfect than cold because it is active and productive. The frigidity of women's temperament is the cause of their abasement and timidity. The idea that women were naturally less intelligent, more timid, and generally less capable than men was therefore rooted in biology in the, in the 16th, 17th century. Fonte agrees with this basic premise that women are colder and damper than men, and, and she explains that this is why women are calmer than men, weaker and more apprehensive by nature, more credulous and easily swayed. But she also says that women are naturally kinder, less angry and less ruled by emotion. But it's telling that even Fonte, who was very pro-women, um, believes that they are e it's easy for women to be swayed, uh, to be led one way or another, um, that they have potential, in other words, for transformation. That transformation is a central part of the ability to transform is a central part of femininity and that biological basis of femininity. The relationship between the balance of humours on the interior of the body affected the appearance, of the, uh, the appearance of the exterior too. This led in the 16th century to the popularity of physiognomical handbooks um, where you, people would be told how to um, understand the personality of people that they met just through looking at them. And this is um, a handbook in Latin by Bartolome de la Rocca. And what we're seeing here, these, these two people here, have a, hot have a hot temperament. This is a hot man and woman. And um, you can see he's got curly hair, and she's got disordered hair, and they're looking quite cross. Uh, this is, <laughs> and this is because they're overly, they're overly hot, um, so to speak. Um, here, we've got some people with dry uh, temperaments. And in this image here, um, these, uh, that, this man and woman, and I don't really know what's happening with his hat. I, I've never really figured that out. Um, they have the perfect balance of humours. People with the perfect balance of humours are ideally beautiful. And beautiful people are, by definition, the most healthy. So appearance, what you look like, whether you meet beauty ideals, isn't just about your external appearance it's about what happens on the inside and so you get some people like Juan Huarte he wrote these books um, in English the examination of man's wits uh, but in uh, but w was originally written in Spanish he was a physician a Spanish physician and writing in the 1570s and his aim was to advise men on the best uh, on, on, on the best um, occupation to take up um, related to their humors and he also advised them on how to find a good wife. And his advice was this. So he divides women into three grades of coldness and dampness. <laughs> the best women are grade two, and that's really typical because everything is in the Renaissance is best is in the middle. So the grade two women of the three are the best. Now, grade two women are beautiful, they are gentle, and they laugh easily. Uh, they have golden hair, peaches and cream skin, and a soft voice. Their body is uh, their body hair is sparse and blonde. It's barely visible. They are obedient by nature, um, absolutely completely fertile, and suitable to marry any man, no matter what his humor or composition is. Grade three women are foolish and ditzy, and they are platinum blonde. They are overly fat with a very white and hairless skin, and not very beautiful. They should only marry men with a hot and dry humor with hot and dry humours, but the best one are the grade one women. And this, these are the ones that you really aspire to be when you read the text, because they have the lowest levels of coldness and dampness, like to be infertile, they have coarse, deep voices, they're thin, dark-skinned, and have a lot of body hair, and sometimes even a bit of a beard. Um, usually these types, he says, are good in conversation. Oh, Jesus. Um, and, afraid to, and afraid to look man, men in the eye. They are ugly and have lots of dark, unruly hair. These women, he says, are with great intelligence and ability, with a good imagination. And this is my favourite bit. Never seed an argument, no matter how small it is, and therefore become unbearable. Um, so when Renaissance artists portrayed these beautiful women, and it, Italian art, probably more than other places, French too, is really, really full of just generic beautiful women. They're, they're called belle donne pictures in Italian because we don't really know what to do with these images or how to really uh, understand them. 
Um, you know, they've all got white skin and fleshy bodies. They're not just demonstrating this kind of artistic ideal of, per, of female beauty, but engaging with this idea of temperament, a kind of, a, a kind of, you know, this idea that you can tell what's going on from mysterious sides. They're showing men what the perfect woman, woman is and showing women uh, the kind of look to trying to achieve. Because of this relationship between exterior and interior, Renaissance men are obsessed with cosmetics. This is one of the reasons why people are so obsessed with cosmetics, because they see things like hair bleaching as a lie, because women are lying about what's happening on their interior, and they see things like face cream that masks the face, like what we'd call foundation, as fundamentally uh, deceitful. And so they kind of talk all the time about surprising women when they're getting ready to go out. I mean, it is a, a really a, a topos that comes up again and again in Italian texts. And this is, must be related to this new genre of painting, the woman at their toilet painting, which is, um, becomes, um, in, comes into being in the early 16th century and um, pioneered by Titian and Giovanni Bellini. Um, so just an example of this uh, kind of, weird obsession with women's deception in cosmetics is Juan uh, Luis Vives's Education of Women, which is a very important uh, text uh, all over Europe, uh, originally published in Latin in 1523. And he berates women for their trickery. He says, miserable you if you attract a husband solely through makeup, because then when you've washed it off, how will he feel about you? It would be mad, he explains, to buy a horse if you only saw the animal covered with ornaments rather than its natural body. We buy slaves and horses uncovered, he says, but not wives. The whole sh um, so this idea that it, was okay to care, that it was okay to care about your humoral system and your humours should reflect, and your exterior reflected your humours, meant that the way that people understood ornament and beauty and cosmetics was divided up in the 16th century between cosmetics that worked what we say from the inside out, okay? So when cosmetics starts to be taught on the university curriculum, which it was in Padua, in the University of Padua, it's taught to physicians in the 1550s, they're very by Gabriele Fallopio, they're very uh, careful about saying exactly what they're teaching. So this is um, Fallopio's De Decorazione, which is um, his lectures on decoration or on uh, the ornaments of the body, cosmetics. Um, and he's not the only person who taught uh, cosmetics. His, um, uh, his successor in the post of the um, professor of surgery at Padua also did too, Girolamo Mercariale, and I'm showing you his book there. Anyway, so Fallopio um, said, Fallopio's remedies here are mainly designed to to make the body better proportioned, and they're mainly related to changing things in the interior. So he has a lot of prescriptions, a lot of advice for thinness and for obesity. He has advice about what to do about over, overly large breasts, and most breasts were overly large in, in this period because they really hate large breasts, or overly large foreskins as well. They have, I, I don't really uh, want to think about that. Um, so he, he, and he um, shunned what we'd now call color cosmetics anything that covers uh, the face. So right at the beginning uh, of uh, this book, he explains what he means by decoration and what he means by beauty. And he says, beauty, he explains, is everything that is natural. Anything else is mud, and we call it whorish. Fallopia's clean dividing lines between the natural and the whorish was, in practice, very difficult to maintain. But I, I just want to draw your attention that Oh, this is, you know, that this kind of beauty is, is feminized in the way that he thinks about it as well. The nature of illnesses, particularly skin conditions, could mean that clearing the condition led to a face or body that was deemed more beautiful. And this was a let out clause that a lot of um, uh, physicians were to use uh, later on in publishing their beauty books. In an era where wrinkles are thought to relate to the drying of humors, anti wrinkle cream could be seen as medicinal. Um, this is quite naturally. Uh, this would quite naturally bring us on to one of the most significant beauty books of the Renaissance period, and I have a copy here, um, Giovanni Marinello's, which you can have a look at. It's from 1574. It's very interesting. Uh, um, Giovanni Marinello's Ornamenti delle Donne, Ornaments of Women. But before we look at this book, and before I share some anti-wrinkle cream for you to try some Renaissance anti-wrinkle cream, I'm going to, uh, you have to listen to a bit more <laughs> of me telling you <laughs> about, about nature and uh, honestly, it will happen, uh, but this bit is, is important. Well, yeah, it's, I think I find it interesting. Okay. 
Okay, so the first printed cosmetic recipe book was printed in, in 1526. It's much earlier than most people uh, think, and it's tiny. So it's a pamphlet of 24 pages. Um, it would be very cheap. You could have bought it for pennies. Um, and it was aimed explicitly at women. Um, so um, these two, so you can see 1526 here. There's actually two editions in 1526. Um, and you can see in the, in the um, terrible poem um, that opens the book, ladies who wish to be fair, this book will fulfil your desire. Uh, I've trans uh, tried to trans translate it with scansion. I won't read all this out because it, my translation is also really terrible, but the poem is, also, is, is, a, is it's a terrible translation of a terrible poem. Um, so, um, it's, so this place is it, this shortness of the book, the fact that these pamphlets were you know, were, were sold for pennies, places it really within, squarely within popular, what we'd call popular culture. It's normally thought that uh, it's only aristocratic women that use cosmetics, but this doesn't seem to be the case at all. Um, this is the kind of uh, market square that people would buy these cosmetic books. They were likely to be sold alongside uh, cosmetics um, uh, ingredients like roses or, um, or um, mirror, uh, things like mirrors and um, pomades, uh, you know, oil-based um, cosmetics that were sold widely and here's some uh, mounty banks and they'd call the street sellers would call these poems out and uh, to, to drum up um, some um, drum up their business so the fact that these texts survive at all indicates that they're probably uh, very very common and there's likely to be many many more of them than um, than is now uh, extant um, not surprising in, in that case that um, at, and they're likely to be related something happens around 1500 in Italy and I have an idea what it is and I'll tell you that later in a, just like two five minutes but um, around 1500 you get a massive expansion of the range of cosmetic recipes available in Italy and that's happened both in printed forms in these books that come out in about 1526 and in manuscripts so you start to get manuscripts dedicated to um, women that were were presumably more fancy, more aristocratic women. And I'm showing you two here, this a really beautiful one from Baltimore uh, in the Walters Museum. That's Italian, Venetian, probably around 1500. And another one from the Welcome, which looks, which is dated at the end of 1596, but looks like, to me, it's like it was started earlier, judging by the handwriting. Um, so cosmetics play a really important role in books of secrets. Um, and I'm showing you here Alessio Piemontese's Book of Secrets uh, from 1555, which is a landmark example of this entire genre of books. Much bigger and ex more expansive than earlier recipe books. It was also notably more popular. It ran to a hundred, hundreds of editions. This is like the book that, if you, it, that people owned in early modern Italy and across Europe. It's got in many, many translations. As historians have noted, the use of the word secrets was not simply a marketing trick, though it definitely was a marketing trick. Um, these books promised to reveal the trade secrets of artisanal practice or the special tricks of aristocratic households to a wider audience, but also the secrets of nature, the secrets of nature herself. Um, the thinking was that all natural things were put on earth by God to aid humanity, but humanity's, humanity needed expertise, needed understanding, needed to investigate nature better, to extract these qualities. Um, so this might involve experimenting with plants, minerals, and animals, and transforming... I've got some nice pictures of... Uh, yeah. And transforming or combining them through processes such as heating, steeping, crushing, uh, distillation. The human action allowed the secret properties of these ingredients to be revealed, for wounds to be salved, conditions to be remedied, horses to be dyed green. There's lots of strange recipes in these books. Moderata Fonte, again, says, God would hardly have placed so many curative powers within plants and stones as he has if we, if we didn't need them and if we weren't intended to use them. Now, it's this revealing of the hidden secrets of nature that form the connection between the recipes in these books. If you have a look at this in some of these books of secrets as a modern person, they can be quite baffling, and they can seem to make no sense at all. So um, in the six books of um, Alessio Piemontese's secret, um, secrets, book of secrets, we have medicines, then we had scented waters, perfumes, basically, then conserves, jam, basically, <laughs> then belletti, which is makeup, 
then dyes and inks, and then metals and gems. This combination is, seems a strange one, um, but the, over, the logic behind it is that all these things involve a transformation of natural ingredients. This revealing of the hidden, the occult secrets of nature that form a narrative thread are also seen in early books of magic. Um, so this is the Italian translation of uh, Gian Battista della Porta's uh, Natural Magic, uh, which is, a, again, a very well-known book. All of these books I talk about are very well-known across Europe. First written in Latin in 1558. And Gian Battista della Porta, in his book on magic, has an entire section. It's divided into 12, but he has an entire section on cosmetics. Because cosmetics are from natural, take things from nature, and they also change the body uh, naturally. They uh, enact change. Um, so this clustering of cosmetics with medicine um, on one side and with secrets and magics on the other is also seen in women's recipe books. This, this is a, a relatively recently found um, a book by um, the Countess of Forli, um, uh, Katarina Schwarzer, who may or may not be pictured uh, here. And her book, um, there's been a published book of hers uh, called The Experimenti, which has been known for a, lot, for, for a long time. But recently they found in the Biblioteca Nazionale in Florence another volume. And you can see this is a, this is a um, table of contents of this. And this, these are recipes for, that we'd call cosmetic recipes. These are recipes for alchemy. These are recipes for horse medicine. Uh, these, are, these are recipes for medicine, for human medicine, and these are spells in Canti. So there's this relationship between magic, cosmetics, medicine, and alchemy um, that is very prevalent in uh, these texts in the 16th century. Um, Katharina Swartz wasn't alone in these experimentations. Um, here's a letter, and it wasn't just rich women either. We just know about the rich women more. Um, this is a letter um, that was written to her by a woman called Anna Abrea, um, Jewish Anna, who sent sorts of some samples of her cosmetic treatments in 1508. Um, she also, uh, um, and it, women are very closely associated with the manipulation of natural materials in the 15th and 16th centuries, particularly distillation. They um, often supplied things like rose water, um, which is made from the distillation of rose petals, um, to and it was all over the place in Renaissance uh, medicine and cosmetic recipes. And they supplied that, they sold that to apothecaries. So we have um, documentation that shows women in this role. However, um, a lot of these women, um, what for men might seem ingenious and exciting and playing with nature and finding nature's secrets for women seemed revolting often and um, unpleasant. And there's a, a genre of text called The Evils of Women uh, that always thinks about women making and applying cosmetics. And this is uh, an example. These are two examples. One's from the 1490s and the other one is from the 1530s. And the full title is um, The um, Evils and Wisdom of Women, um, uh, narrating all their makeup and distilled waters, sublimates, um, bleaches, powders, and pastes um, that they use to make themselves beautiful. Um, and some advice uh, about, from a philosopher about whether you should marry or not, and the, advance, uh, the answer to that is no. Um, <laughs> um, so the idea of this verse, this book, is so what, do, what happens in this verse is they tell the reader to imagine a woman sitting in her chamber. And now I quote from my translation. She should be stripped from the belt upwards. This is very... Yeah, you can, imagine, you can quite imagine how, why this is exciting for men to think about. Stripped from the belt upwards, and then it gets worse, actually. Arms bare to better plaster her face. First she starts to apply oils to make rough skin fresh. They often used chewed up bitter almonds or peach stones with water from cooked bread to wash the face and neck and the whole belly. She starts to remove hair with tweezers, first eyebrows and then the pubic pigsty. And when it's removed, she puts their bat's blood so that these pores remain closed and smooth. And bat's blood actually was used after hair removal uh, and makes the skin bald and without hair. Pine water and lemon juice 
orange flower water and mussel shells from the sea and more ingredients. Some are distilled and some are placed steaming on the faces of these most evil demons. And all these things that I have told you, they adopt when they're making themselves up. Oh, just look at the shit they cover themselves with. <laughs> um, so there's this weird kind of prurience in this first. Like, oh, let's imagine this woman in a chamber. And then there's also this kind of revulsion. But also, actually, there's a real insight in, and knowledge of cosmetic procedures, because all these things that they mention are used in cosmetics, um, including shit, actually. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but I haven't bought that as a sample uh, for you to try. Um, so the, um, we can get more insight into these women in a variety of sources. So this is an amazing source called um, The Portrait of Lotsana Andalusa, uh, The Portrait of uh, Andalusi and Lotsana. That was a play written by a converso, a recent convert from Judaism to Christianity. The Jews were expelled uh, from Spain in 1492, and many of them came to Italy because there were big Jewish communities in Italy. And this is really where these recipes are coming from. There's a very sophisticated culture uh, um, of cosmetic use between Muslim, Jewish and Christian women in, in medieval Spain and there's been some great work on this by Spanish historians um, and when they come when these immigrants come to Italy it seems likely that this is why in around 1500 you see this explosion in, cult, in, um, in cosmetics culture and this book traces what happens to one of these um, Jewish immigrants called Lotsana. And um, I'm showing you here an image from the book. And this is Lotsana plucking. She works as a beautician, basically. And she plucks the eyebrows of one of her friends. Um, she also uh, lends out beds for sex workers. Um, and here are things that she's drying. And here's her um, helper, Rampan, who's making things in a pestle and mortar. Um, so... Lotsana, um, he says, uh, makes her living by concocting facial preparations with powders, rouges and creams, plucking eyebrows and beautifying betrothed women um, while they prepare treatments of rock candy, lotions and the jujube tree and astringents for female parts. Um, now, I've only just really started this work, but there is associations between cosmetic and particularly novel cosmetic practice with these Jewish immigrants. Um, and, with this, and often this leads to a lot to anti-Semitism as well. Um, so you get people like Ludovico Ariosto, who's this really important um, poet and playwright in 16th century Italy, um, who writes a lot about cosmetics, actually, both men and women's cosmetics use. But he was really vicious about Jewish suppliers. Uh, and this is his satire number five. And I apologise in advance because this is really horrible. If Herculean, he says, knew where he put his lips when he kisses Lydia, he'd be more disgusted than if he kissed an arsehole marked with scabies. He doesn't know that face cream is made with the spit of the Jewish women who sell it, nor that they temper it with musk to hide its evil smell. He doesn't know they mix the shit they, the shit they mix in with the circumcisions of their children and the fat of horrid snakes that they always have ready farmed. There are numerous other fragments where you can see that Jewish people did actually make uh, a living in this, in, in, in creating cosmetic treatments. Emanuele Ongaro, for example, um, which means hung Hungarian uh, Emanuele, um, in 1590 was given a license uh, in Mancho, which is very, a, a very liberal city for Jewish people, um, was given the exclusive right to make and sell musk and ambergris paste. In Giuseppe, Pass Giuseppe Pass's uh, text, The Defects of Women, which is another one of these hate women misogynistic text um, against women and particularly around makeup. He complains that Jewish women sell um, hair pieces, sell fa fake hair pieces. And this is something that I've come across in other texts about Jewish people creating these amazing loops and um, long hair tresses and things that they added to hair in the Renaissance. Um, they always have innumerable braids, he says, to sell and haggle over. Cosmetics manufacture was perhaps like usury, something that was both needed but frowned upon in Christian practice. So the gap was filled by those at the margins of society. As Natalie Zeman Davis has suggested, the margins could be areas of necessary creativity. There are also intriguing connections between the cultures of cosmetics, folk medicine and witchcraft. Um, much of the population, I'm just showing you, uh, I'll, I'll come to that in a minute, and this is an image that I think is probably of a witch 
Um, they used to say it was St. Margaret, but I really don't think it's St. Margaret. Um, they, <laughs> judging by her gesture and her dress and this strange uh, thing here. Um, there are also intriguing con con connections between the culture of cosmetics, folk medicine, and witchcraft. An archetypal example might be a woman named Madalena the Weaver, who was put on trial in Rome in 1613 for manufacturing poison. And there's, I've got a whole chapter on murder and makeup in my book, and it's, there's a lot of relationships between women getting arsenic and things and pretending it's for poison and using it to poison their horrible husbands. Um, Madalena offered love magic to clients as well as poison, <laughs> rented out rooms to sex workers, and also made waters for washing women's faces, oils and herbs of various kinds. Love magic was a really common form of witchcraft in Italy. Um, there's lots of examples of uh, women being holed up before the Italian Inquisition for creating love magic. And it was often, like a lot of witchcraft, had similar ingredients and similar techniques to cosmetics manufacture. So you get um, uh, some women in Venice in the 1590s were holed up before the Inquisition for using oil, using holy oil to kiss the, the kiss the, the, um their suitors with to bind them and others use um, things like um, oils to rub on their um, suitor. Um, this witch manual of 1608, uh, the Compendium Maleficarum, talks a lot about witches anointing their victims with lotions, waters, oils and unguents. He says they anoint the thighs or belly or head, throat, breast, ribs or some other part of the body. Witches use flying ointment um, and recipes often do complain, complain, things like bat's blood, they do contain things that we consider quite uh, witchy. Um, special ointments, oils, salves and potions are often described in trials. Generally, of course, from confessions extracted under torture, so you have to be really careful about how you use this material. So this is, I think, a really stunning uh, document. It's, a, it's an autograph, a confession of a witch call, of, a, of someone who was he was um, imprisoned for witchcraft called Bellezze Ursini uh, from 1528. Um, and it's a really distressing story, actually, because uh, she killed herself in prison when she was 60 uh, rather than be uh, executed. Before she died, she wrote a plea for forgiveness in her own hand, and there's about six pages of this. Uh, these pages filled with a childlike halting script admit to all sorts of sorcery having sex with the devil, killing and eating infants at his behest, teaching other women sorcery, and bewitching people in various ways. She also insisted that she helped many people too, medicating and curing diseases of all kinds. Like Countess Katerina Swartzer, Bellezze claimed to have written a book of secrets, which included recipes, incantations and ointments. Whilst Katerina was heralded for her knowledge, if censored after her death, Bellezze killed herself in prison. So cosmetics isn't just... This, this, you know, call, calling women too curious, constantly interested in cosmetics, constantly interested in nature, does have this kind of side of danger uh, to women and is, you know, an indication you have to remember how misogynistic and how um, difficult uh, women's lives are in uh, the early modern period. Anyway, so you have this impossible situation where women are meant to look in a certain way, but they're not meant to really make cosmetics and they're uh, distrusted if they experiment. And so what you do is doctors basically come in to fill that gap and, and other, other men who, who take these recipes that are part of the folk tradition and publish them. Um, so the first text of this kind, uh, which is named is this one, it's 1555, um, and it's by a guy called Giovanni Metafatura Rossetti, um, and it has loads of recipes for um, potions, and uh, it, says, it says potions for perfumes, oils, balls, musk balls, little balls, and, he, and he, it's clear that he's brought together numerous secrets, and he said, and there's no poison in it at all. <laughs> um, and this is something that they really said. It says, no poison, you won't get poisoned by this, because this is obviously that they're worried about women poisoning people. There is little difference, he said, between the application of his staff, of his art, what he, he calls it his art, and, and nature. He said, one is a mother, nature is a mother, and the other is a daughter. So basically, you're not going to change, you're not going to falsify nature. His book was pretty successful, but not as successful as this one. And this is... Giovanni Marinella's Ornaments of Ladies. And this is why I went on. This whole project is down. It's, it could be blamed on this book. Um, I started my research here. 
Marinella was a physician, uh, and this book is great because you're slightly embarrassed. Marinella was slightly embarrassed about makeup, about being associated with makeup, and so he writes this really big um, excuse right at the beginning in his dedicatory letter, which is really interesting. So it's over 600 pages. It contains 1,400, more than 1,400 recipes for various types of cosmetic and hygiene product. And it's organised in four sections. Each section is, uh, go, it goes from the top of the head to the bottom of the feet. And each section is prefaced by an explanation of what women should look like. Um, so he, all, he explains that all women should be seen as naturally beautiful. And then he says, I mean by naturally beautiful... The beauty, the quality is described by ancient and modern poets and painters. So basically he means that women should look like fictional characters. Um, and he goes and he quotes Petrarch. He says, Petrarch says that you should look like this, and Ariosto says you should look like this, and this is how to get that look. Um, and that basically goes right through the book. Marinello, though, is interesting because he gives wholesale justifications for women's cosmetic practice. Um, he doesn't divide up... Uh, hang on, let's... It, it give, so in this, pre, this is one of his um, prefaces, um, which um, starts to talk about his justifications and why women should, um, should um, have cosmetic practice. He explains, we like ornate manners, we admire well-proportioned bodies and love natural beauties. But how much more? If we like these natural things, how much more should we like, admire and love manners, bodies and beauties that have been acquired by human industry? In other words, it's better. Cosmetics are better than, than nature. I don't know if you're familiar. I don't know. You might be familiar with Vasari, Vasari Georgia Vasari's Life of the Artists, and in the third life, uh, the life with Michelangelo and the life with Leonardo da Vinci, he says that artists, instead of emulating nature, are surpassing nature by the 1550s. And this is exactly what Giovanni Marinello is claiming. He's claiming that doctors are surpassing nature and can make nature better. Um, um, even if you're already beautiful, Marinello says, you can be more beautiful if you buy his book. Uh, <laughs> although a woman may be beautiful, she should not disdain, he says, the enhancement of her beauty, given that nothing is perfect in this world. Moreover just, as, moreover, just as a beautiful horse that is not tamed, a lot of comparing of women to horses, is not of great value, excellent virtue in an ugly body is buried in dung. Basically, if you read Marinella's book and look at the recipes, a lot of the recipes are nicked from women. And he does ascribe them sometimes to like aristocratic ladies. So he says, this is from a grand Arabic lady, or this is from the empress of Byzantium, Irene. Um, and, uh, but often, and the first edition, he says all the recipes are from a, by a Greek queen. He makes up this, fabricates this Greek queen. But also, he, dotted through, he acknowledges other debts. So he says, oh, this recipe is from some beautiful women, a pleasant lady, a damsel of my district, or one of our young little country girls. Um, there are recipes from men too, especially a troop of worthy doctors, but these are vastly outnumbered by the women that he mentions. And this is really commonplace in books of secrets too, that they mention, oh, this is from the Duchess of Imola, this is from this woman, this is from that woman, um, as, uh, as well as uh, humbler folk. So, uh, and I always say this, and, and I hope she publishes it soon, because at a recent research workshop, uh, the historian uh, Montserrat Cabray calls these repeated attributions, uh, recipes to women, small stories. So you get these tiny fragmented stories into this lost world of women's cosmetics and women's knowledge and women's expertise um, that's brought to us, unfortunately, by these male writers. Um, and a major challenge for the historian is how to make these small stories bigger. And one of the ways we've been doing this is through reconstruction. Um, I've been reconstructing makeup recipes for years now, for about 15 years. Um, and I'm still, we're still, reconstruction as a historical um, a methodology is still uh, relatively in its infancy, though it's getting much more popular. And here's some uh, recent uh, books on the subject. Um, and um, one of the things that I've been looking at is, is how to choose which of these 1,400 recipes uh, to make. And we have been making uh, recipes particularly that have been annotated a lot in different versions of the book. Um, so one of the things that's clear from looking at all these annotations is that people like recipes that are easy. 
Um, that the, you know, the shorter they are, the fewer uh, ingredients they have, they tend to have more uh, annotations. And this is an example of a lemon balm cure for scabies. Scabies is a very common... I'll show you some pictures of scabies in a minute, but you can't wait. Uh, I haven't bought this one. Um, but it doesn't just cure scabies. It basically has this whole list of things uh, that it does, um, from um, console-afflicting spirits to curing, uh, uh, to, to curing strokes. Um, and, and this is scabies. Um, very, very common in the Renaissance. Very itchy, quite unpleasant, very difficult to cure at that point. And it's very easy to make. You just make it's lemon balm and wine, and wine, and then you just distill it. As long as you've got distillation equipment or a pan with an upturned lid, you can do it. Um, I didn't bring that because it's, I think it might be illegal to distill wine at home. So I always a bit, I have made it, but I just worry about sharing it with people. Uh, <laughs> but I have bought this one. So this is a recipe for anti-wrinkle cream. And it um, has in it um, sheep fat. Um, and I'll show you. I'll show you. It's here. You can... You can pass it around. Uh, sheep fat that has been washed nine times in cold water, and I'll show you how this works later. And mix with egg white and with a bit of butter. Then add some powdered mastic. Yeah, mastic. And frankincense. And, and apply it to the forehead. Now, you're very, very welcome to try this. You can smell it. I've got some cotton buds so that afterwards perhaps you can come up if you want to try some on. But if you just want to smell these, we can hand these around now. It's, um, while you do that, I'll, I'll just explain why it's difficult to make early modern recipes. <laughs> uh, one of the reasons why it's difficult to make early modern recipes is that the system of weights and measures is completely different. They often don't mention weights and measures. Uh, so um, I made actually 100 grams of this, but it, the original uh, recipe was for a pound of mutton tallow, which is a lot of mutton tallow. And this is likely that it was made to be shared. <laughs> yeah, it's not bad, is it? <laughs> um, so um, mutton tallow is, a, is, you have to wash the mutton tallow first. It's very squee, it's very um, friable fat. <laughs> okay, I'll show you my mutton tallow washing. You have to wash it nine times in cold water. This is horrible to do. And every time I make this mutton tallow, I think, why, I, why do I do this? Because it's not a nice job at all. There we go. That's me washing it. You can hear how squidgy it is. Um, and... But what you're doing here is just trying to integrate a tiny little bit of water in the mutton tallow. Then you have to mix it with egg white formed with pestle and mortar. <laughs> and now, this is me pretending, pretending that I have mixed this with a wooden spoon, but I haven't. I've mixed it with a, with a cake mixer. <laughs> Because women in the Renaissance were much better at mixing things. They did. They had much, had much, better, upper, much better arm strength. Because honestly, I got so bored of mixing it with a wooden spoon, I just couldn't be bothered anymore, and I wasn't fast enough. So that's why I needed a mixer. But women in the Renaissance would have been better at it, I presume. And what this does is it forms an emulsion. And so when you can feel the cream, um, which we'll do whenever, you know, maybe at the drinks or something, if everyone wants to feel it, it does feel like a moisturiser. It doesn't feel like a fat. It feels fluffy um, and, and like, it feels like Nivea cream or something like that, quite heavy moisturiser. And then we added some powdered mastic and incense. Do you sm smell the mastic and incense? And this is much nicer. This is this was much better part of the process. <laughs> Um, and actually, it was great. I didn't know what mastic or incense smelt like, really, before I did this. It, they're very... Comp they're, these are tree gums. Uh, mastic is, um, is, uh, has antibacterial properties. Frankincense is widely used. was widely used in church. It st might still smell churchy to some of you. Um, and um, crushing them is a really satisfying thing to do because they don't smell very much when they're in the form of tears. And then you suddenly crush them in the kitchen. Smells of mastic and frankincense. They... Uh, I have to say my family are a bit bored of the kitchen smelling of mastic and frankincense now because I've done this recipe several times. Um, so, okay. So one of the things, so 
what we learned really by doing this, and this is the fundamental thing we learned, is how much we didn't know about the properties of these ingredients and how you, how you uh, mix them. And this was everyday knowledge. This isn't, a lot of this knowledge that we got from making the recipe wasn't included in the, in the recipe itself because everyone knew. Everyone knew what it meant to wash fat. Everyone knew what, what would happen you know, at the end of the recipe. If you mix egg white into something, it emulsifies and turns into this fluffy kind of white material. It wasn't necessary to write that down. Um, this recipe appears in many, many texts, not just Marinette so it's quite a popular one um, and it really it made me think about my attitude actually to Renaissance women which was it was somehow that I know more than them but that's just not the case it really humbles you uh, in the face of the knowledge of the past um, in terms of the properties of the ingredients tallow is, is actually has vitamin E has linoleic acid and it. it has several ingredients that are now used in skin care and thought to prevent skin ageing. Mastic and frankincense are anti antimicrobial properties, anti-inflammatory and calm the skin. And they also stop you smelling of sheep too much. Um, <laughs> though it is still a bit sheepy. Um, they can have possibly known this information in the Renaissance, but perhaps through experience, through repeated use, this was somehow uh, understood as being something that was useful uh, for stretch marks. Uh, it was used for stretch marks and for uh, wrinkles of the face. Okay, and I'll just wind up by going back to the beginning. So after this long, pretty too long journey <laughs> around uh, Renaissance cosmetics culture, uh, I'm going to end where we began with the Caravaggio, Martha and Mary so this painting, so often talked about in terms of Caravaggio's genius or you know, the patron's interest in the Counter-Reformation, can also be understood, and I think can really usefully be understood as a tiny fragment of a whole world of cosmetics and beauty that we still actually know very little about. Uh, very few people write about cosmetics, um, and despite the massive amount of primary source material uh, that's related to it. This is a realm of knowledge formerly, cosmetics is a realm of knowledge formerly dominated by women that was increasingly taken over by male physicians as the 16th century wore on um, and something that women were increasingly criticised for during the Counter-Reformation. It's a whole field that gives us new insights into the obsessive revisiting of the relationship between art and nature that's to dominate the 16th century. Interestingly, because of Mary Magdalene's saintly faint, Fate commentators were keen to show that despite her initial sinfulness, she was still naturally superior to other women. The 1546 text that I talked about earlier explains, washes, varnishes and sublimates, skin peels and white lead and colours, and tweezers to make eyelashes, eyelashes arched, as our, maiden, our maidens do, they were never used by this woman, by Mary Magdalene, who by nature had beautiful skin. With the forces of nature and a misogynistic patriarchy uh, ranged against them, however much ingenuity they displayed, it seems that Renaissance women could never win. Thank you. It's, uh, thank you so much, first of all. That was such a fascinating, um, kind of for me as well, a journey into something that I'm not very familiar with. It just made me think about you know, how... You can look differently at things that we know quite well, or it's a very different approach from the kind of great artist mm -hmm. method as well, you know, to kind of think of how other details can take you into other worlds which feel quite distant to us. But there's also some familiarity, I think, maybe as a woman just thinking about the, the role that cosmetics play, you know, my own life. And so that's really, you know, again, the, that sort of turning these worlds and art worlds upside down or inside out. And so thank you for that. Just kind of made me think very differently. But um, I just wanted to know about your own journey and how you came to this research and this work. Can you tell you, you don't have to re recite your CV to us, but you know, what, what, what was it that kind well, of gave you the way into this? It was, it was via body hair removal. <laughs> oh, <wow>. Yeah, <laughs> because I wrote, <laughs> as, as things, so many things are. Uh, no, because I wrote a book on the nude, yeah. on the Italian Renaissance nude. Um, and I was looking at uh, female life models and about the advent of life drawing. And I looked at men and I looked at women. And a lot of the female life models had no body hair. And I thought, well, is that, is that a practice that was... It's not to do with artists, just not drawing body hair. And it's obviously to do with classical sculpture. But is it the case that women 
did women remove their body hair in, in Renaissance Italy? And, and I thought there wouldn't be any sources. And then I looked, my word, <laughs> so many sources about body hair removal. Yeah. Um, so I um, started, I, I thought, well, there's, there's a, something to write about this. And my interest initially was really to think about the pressure of visual culture. You know, what's, what's the influence of the nude, sudden, nude form suddenly kind of exploding on, um, on visual culture? How does that make people feel about their own bodies? Um, and uh, I was particularly interested in b both men and women, but then I, there was much more on, on women's bodies and women's relationship with cosmetics. And it was just clear that no one... It's so important to people, mm. so important to people's lives, and that no one... That the history of cosmetics is a very understudied mm. field. Um, I know the people who study... You know, I know all of them. We all know each other. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, it is... That, the, the role of secrecy, yeah. you know, and how Absolutely. that's still actually mm. perpetuated in a yeah. way, that yeah. the kind of these great mysteries of youth <laughs> what, what, and, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, looking glowing so it is yeah. interesting again it sort of speaks to our ages mm -hmm. I'm going to open up um, if there are any questions uh, from the floor or online um, we've got one here and Kathleen's going to bring you a, a microphone so people online can hear thank you hi thank you for this fantastic talk I really enjoyed it um, my question is about the sourcing of the ingredients, um, and this might be my own bias as an Americanist, but where, or have you found any of the materials or the ingredients that come specifically from other places that are maybe considered exotic, and like what's the, their role, how do they feature in the stories, are they perceived as maybe more dangerous, less dangerous, like what's, what's the deal with them? Um, this is a really good question, and um, in a very kind of, and there's a lot of material that you could work on with this, but that work really remains to be done, largely. Um, so most, a lot of the ingredients from cosmetics are imported. Um, so mastic, for example, is imported. Then when you get into the 16th century, you do get ingredients coming from the Americas uh, as well. Um, and ingredients, in, exported to the Americas from Spain. There's just been a, a recent article um, uh, about 16th century boats going to um, islands, the islands, I think, and I think the mainland uh, in the New World from Spain with things like white lead in, mm -hmm. that are used uh, for cos cosmetics extensively. So, um, and the ingredients are considered, the, the more strange the ingredient, the more exciting the cosmetic seems to be mm -hmm. so you get things like pearls used as well and powdered mm -hmm. marble and and some some massively long ingredient lists um and so they're obviously you know they're obviously prized but really i mean i think that's a research project that just does need to be done i think it's a really interesting question um but and my hunch is that there's there'll be a lot there yeah <laughs> <laughs> thank you Thanks so much, Jill. That was absolutely brilliant. I would just wonder if you could say a little bit more about your recreative, reconstructive methodologies. Mm -hmm. um, was that something you set out to do with the project at the very beginning? Or was it more as you really kind of uncovered the number of recipes um, that you thought, actually, this is something to try out and see how that played out? But also, I mean, you sort of reference it a little bit in terms of what it make remaking what it actually shifted in terms of the tacit knowledge but can you say a little bit more were there any other surprises that came through actually the remaking practice that you weren't getting from the visual or material or textual um sources thank you um so there's two questions there really um so the first, the first uh, one is that we started reconstruction <laughs> i used to live downstairs in edinburgh from a herbalist and um, she's like a really great friend uh, now. And um, we started, as, you know, we just talked about, or, you know, I said, well, so why are they using nettles, Anna? <laughs> Tell me about nettles. And she said, oh, nettles are great for the skin, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and so we made, you know, we started making these things. And then I had a, a long time ago, I had a Leverhulme um, grant. And I just um, spent that on working with a student of mine, Jackie Spicer, who did a PhD on earlier uh, cosmetics. And um, we did this big event at the National Gallery of Scotland and we ma made all these cosmetics and it was brilliant. And actually did a Renaissance makeover, used some colour cosmetics to see. So we learned things like, you know, so for example, 
There's this pastiche of Renaissance makeup that's this white mask, like you see on images of Elizabeth I, or like in films of Elizabeth I, but that really comes from films. Mm. Actually, if you actually re recreate the makeup, even because you can't use white lead, unfortunately, because of health and safety, <laughs> uh, but, uh, even using like something like titanium dioxide, the way that the makeup goes on the skin is much more like foundation. So the, a lot of this stuff is it, about disentangling like a centuries of misogyny <coughs> and distrust of makeup from actually what is actually going on in, 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 with this makeup and in, in these sources. Um, and, and I'm still not happy with reconstruction as a methodology and I still don't, still don't think I've quite got that right um, yet about how to write about it and how to think about it. Um, but it's one of the only ways I feel that I've had anything like the experience of these poor women who were making the makeup. Um, there's just no other way, because the only, the only evidence you get from them directly is through trial, is through trials. Mm -hmm. And that's really compromised <coughs> evidence. Um, so at least uh, somehow through recreating this. And I, I'm also thinking, you know, from the perspective of someone who works with images a lot, does all the evidence we need does it all, always need to be verbal? Why, are we, why is reconstructing any more problematic or any less problematic than using your own text? Um, so I'm also thinking along those lines as well, but I'm still, that's definitely in development. I think Rebecca has some um, questions from our online audience, so we'll hear. Yeah, we have quite a few, so we may need to kind of alternate. <laughs> um, the, is this mic working? I think, yeah. Um, okay, starting wearing Oksanen, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing her name, um, says clearly men were deeply concerned about being tricked by women and their cosmetics and obviously misogynistic anxiety that is mystifyingly popular today. Are there publications directed at men on how to improve themselves or on how to know if they're being duped by women or was all the expectation and blame laid at women? Thank you. Uh, yeah, there are publications. I mean, like the one that I read out, um, which said, oh, I'm going to reveal all the secrets of women, and this is how you can tell if you're being duped. There's advice, for example, and some of it's kind of half-joking, that if you're going to get married to a woman, you should try and surprise her in the morning before she's got her makeup on. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's advice to yes. women uh, to, to, there's advice to women to wear like lip stain so that if you get surprised in the morning, yeah. you still have like red lips and red cheeks. So this kind of back and forth between these, um, these, this, this kind of text, I think, um, there's, there's also, uh, you know, many, many men are also under constant scrutiny in this period. And there's a lot of advice to them about, you know, having an upright demeanour, about exercise, about, uh, you know, correct uh, de deportment and things like that. It just takes a different kind of flavour to that of women. Should I keep going? Yeah, I have another one, yeah. <laughs> uh, Valentina Tomasetti. Um, so thanks for the fascinating talk. What about using cosmetics to mask certain attitudes? I'm thinking of Alessandro... Um, Piccolomini's claim that shame can be faked through fake blushing, for example. Do you think women use these pockets of cosmetic creativity to fake identities? Well, the big, I mean, I suppose, I suppose the most <coughs> obvious example there would be, would be courtesan culture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these women who you dressed in a certain way and used ornament in a certain way to mimic, you know, the anxiety was that they were looked just like aristocratic women and you couldn't tell the difference. Uh, so I suppose that would be the difference. I mean, blushing has a whole history of its own in terms of uh, um, replicating blush and pretending to blush and pretending to be shamefaced. Um, and there are actually, you know, articles later on, uh, there's, there's a whole book, I think, about blushing in an English context in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and, but that, again, that work hasn't been done yet in Italy. So if anyone wants to work on this, please do. <laughs> because it hasn't done it, I know, you know, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Well, there's a question here. Hi, you, you mentioned how beauty and health were ideas that were connected, mm -hmm. and it made me think about how during the like, 19th century, consumption and like, pale, young yeah. women that died, and especially poets as well, men also, mm -hmm. um, they were considered really beautiful even though they were ill, and I wondered if that idea was also present in the Renaissance or at what point that changed. There's something about Renaissance illnesses that's very different, but I've come across that as well because I've got a student who's working on pre-Raphaelite models. Um, and uh, the, 
the big feared illnesses in Renaissance weren't, uh, cons weren't, weren't consumption, weren't consumptive, and, and didn't last a long time. So if you got the plague, for example, you'd be dead within a day or two. Um, so there isn't a lot, a lot of time to sit around looking beautiful. <laughs> um, also, they, they also tend to mark the skin, a lot of the diseases that are around. So smallpox, for example, is a massively feared disease that marks the skin really badly and also caused loss of hair amongst women. And so you don't have this beautiful waif um, thing. Health is all associated with a certain kind of plump, um, plump wellness uh, that you don't get. That's a particularly 19th century, I think, or maybe maybe there's other times to do it, but certainly it's not. I've not come across it in the 16th century. Go yeah. So let's well, while you've got the mic, okay. what, let's have another online question. Yeah. <laughs> and then maybe then one more in the room, and then I think we'll... Yeah, we have a lot online, so I might need to you know, somehow share yeah. these with you later. That's what we'll do, definitely. Um, Gillian Forrester says, a fascinating lecture. Thank you, Jill. The welcome exhibition is also remarkable. Could you talk about the role of mirrors in these discourses on cosmetics and female beauty? I think that functional glass mirrors were not in use until the early 16th century with the most advanced made in Venice and they must have been very costly initially. I noticed that the mirrors in the Titian and the Caravaggio you showed were both convex. Mm -hmm. What impact would that have had on views on the aesthetics of beauty? I actually have a chapter on mirrors in my book. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because the, uh, one of the things I do talk about is the invention of the full-length mirror. And so that you don't get full-length mirrors until the very late 15th century, and they don't get common until the early years of the 16th century. And I think it does have a massive impact on people's understandings of their bodies and what they look like to an outsider. Um, and this is um, possibly related also to things like dieting culture. Um, and to um, this obsession that you get in the 16th century with putting the body in proportion, um, which you typically don't get in 15th century texts, which is all to do with facial uh, makeup. Um, because you can see yourself accurately, clearly, as a whole body, as other people more or less see you, which you can't, simply can't do in a convex mirror. Was there another question in the room? Okay. Great. Or maybe one more. Let's have one more if there's a good, some good questions lining up. Um, Lorraine Murray apologizes that she missed the start of the talk, but is interested in the possibility of regional variations or published books. Do they concentrate on particular places, or is there evidence of similar books or recorded practices elsewhere? So, else, I mean, I, you can't say, but elsewhere in a lot of these books, um, Italy is a particular, Italy is very important central for publishing in the 16th century. So a lot of these books come out of Italy, partly because a lot of books come out of Italy. Um, but also Venice becomes particularly famous for its beauty culture and for its cosmetic culture. And, and there's almost kind of some eroticization related to Venetian women bleaching their hair and things like that. Um, so they are particularly associated with Italy, but Marinello, for example, um, there's a version of Marinello's text in French, and then it gets translated into English in the 17th century um, by this guy called Jameson, um, called, uh, in a book called Artificial Embellishments, um, <laughs> which is very, very, so misogynistic, it's quite funny. I, my students really love it. Um, and uh, so, so, but the recipes change. So they pick and choose the recipes. They're not direct translations, and this is very common with recipe books. Um, and so you get very common recipes in the English context, like rosemary, for example. Rosemary in, in wine, in white wine. Beauty recipe that's used all the time in England that's hardly ever seen. In, you don't really see it so much in Italy. So, yeah, it does change. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jill. And thank you to everyone for those really fascinating questions. I know the in-house audience are probably desperate to try out the anti-wrinkle cream. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we'll and all have, have, we'll and, and yeah, out and we'll all be 20 years new, younger. Yeah, new <laughs> women and men. Um, so thank you uh, so much, and thank you for everyone joining us um, here in Bedford Square and online. Um, and I think we have another event on Friday, um, our research lunch. Um, so if you're in London, please do join us. It's oh, it's online. Fantastic. So wherever you are in the world, you can join us for that. And that's the last event of our season. Um, we'll have a short break for Easter. And then we've got a really packed programme um, of 
uh, evening events, of lunchtime events, of um, workshops and conferences. So I hope that you'll be able to join us for some of those um, in the future as well. But let's all just thank Jill for such an enlightening and really interesting talk, which has taken us um, through so many it's sort of ingredients, through painting, through so many materials as well as methods. So thank you so much, Jill. Thank you. Thank you.